Chapter 3, Histology of the Oral Mucosa. In this chapter, we're going to cover a number of related tissue types found within the oral cavity. But first, let's take a step back and review the histology of the skin. The skin is composed of an epithelium and underlying connective tissues. The epithelium is always a stratified squamous epithelium that is keratinized. Keratin is a protein produced by the cells of this epithelium. It is a tough water resistant protein. Therefore, we name the cells that produce it keratinocytes. Underneath them are a couple of different connective tissues. First, a thin layer of areolar connective tissue, which is a loose connective tissue that can provide space for blood vessel growth in its ample ground substance material. Deep to that is a dense irregular connective tissue, which is composed mostly of collagen fibers and does not provide as much space for blood supply. The epithelial layer can also be called the epidermis. This is a more old fashioned name for the outer layer. And the epidermis of the skin has a high level of keratinization, which provides it with a high degree of water resistance. It's not waterproof, which anybody in Oregon, which is where I'm from, can tell you there's a big difference between water resistant and waterproof. It significantly, but not completely, reduces the loss of water out of the skin. Where the epidermis connects to the dermis is not flat, but is instead bumpy, which increases the surface area between the two and makes for a stronger connection. The downward pointing bumps are called reti ridges or reti pegs whereas the upward pointing bumps of the dermis are called dermal papillae. The epithelium undergoes a lot of changes. Stem cells found within the stratum basale are undergoing mitosis, producing two sister cells, one of which stays a stem cell and the other differentiates into a keratinocyte the only choice possible for these stem cells. These keratinocytes begin making keratin, and as they get older, they are pushed outwards and eventually die. It takes about a month or so for all of the epithelial cells, except for the stem cells, to be completely replaced within the epidermis. Sometimes cells might need to migrate to a distant location in which case they would remove their desmosomes. Otherwise, they will remain attached to their neighbors throughout their lifespan. Different regions of the skin will be replaced at different rates, but we of course are going to be more interested in the epithelial cells of the oral cavity, which aren't called skin, but instead are part of the oral mucosa. This table here shows the turnover time for different regions of the oral mucosa. And as you can see, there's a lot more happening inside the oral cavity, probably because of the increased friction and damage from chewing, oral bacteria, chemicals from our food, and saliva. The fastest area of the oral mucosa to be replaced is the junctional epithelium. Underneath the epidermis, or the epithelial layer, are regions of connective tissue. These together would be called the dermis, which is composed of a papillary layer, or a region of areolar connective tissue, followed by a thicker layer of dense irregular connective tissue the old-fashioned name for which was the reticular layer of the dermis. Although keep in mind, that has nothing to do with reticular connective tissue. It is a dense, irregular connective tissue 
and is responsible for the strength of our skin. Next are regions of the skin that fold inwards called hair follicles. These are invaginations of the epidermis and the epithelial cells that extend deeper into the skin have a slightly different job than the epithelial cells at the surface of the skin. These keratinocytes produce a harder keratin that ultimately turns into a hair. The living cells are known as the hair follicle, whereas the hair itself is composed strictly of dead keratinocytes, making a harder type of keratin than it is found in the rest of the skin. This structure will be important to keep in mind because it's very similar to the structure of a tooth bud. Before we get to the oral mucosa, let's talk about repair to damage in the skin because it'll be very similar to the repair of damage within the oral mucosa. When there is an injury to the skin, there are going to be a couple of repair processes that occur very quickly and then a couple that occur very slowly. Damage to the skin will first involve a blood clot or hemostasis. This will form a scab to prevent further blood loss. This will also trigger an inflammatory response that happens very quickly within seconds after injury. This is because damaged cells release inflammatory molecules, such as prostaglandins, which can trigger local vasodilation, pain, and cause some of the other symptoms involved in the inflammatory response. That is all occurring very quickly, measured within minutes. The slow responses, occur over days or weeks. First, one of our slow responses will be angiogenesis, or the production of new blood vessels. This will take a significant amount of time to finish because we are undergoing mitosis to produce new cells, which will form new tissues. We need angiogenesis to occur to increase the amount of blood that can flow to this area to provide the nutrients and the energy required to regenerate the damaged tissue. That regeneration will be happening during this proliferative phase, and it may be followed by a remodeling phase because we frequently fill in injuries with one type of tissue that may provide a scaffolding and then replace that scaffolding with a more mature type of tissue. The end of the remodeling phase would also include the removal of those blood vessels after they are no longer needed by the process of apoptosis or programmed cell death. So let's go into these processes in more detail. I'm going to simplify the cartoon here and focus primarily on some epithelial cells and the underlying blood vessels found in the connective tissue. When there's damage to any tissue type, that can lead to cell death. And when cells die uncontrollably, they may release their lysosomes, which could damage nearby cells, which when they died could release their lysosomes, damaging nearby cells. And if this process wasn't stopped, we would have a wound that continues to grow in size, and we would call this necrosis. So to stop this from happening, we're going to trigger the inflammatory response. Damaged cells also release inflammatory molecules, such as prostaglandins, which can diffuse to nearby tissues. Nearby blood vessels will vasodilate, increasing blood flow to this area. This would cause the area to become reddish. If you slap somebody on their face, and their face turns red a few seconds later, it's this increase in blood flow that causes that quick redness to occur. We're going to need increased blood flow 
to provide more nutrients that will provide the energy for the repair process that will occur later. It will also attract white blood cells. White blood cells migrating to the site of injury can release other inflammatory molecules, which will attract more white blood cells in a positive feedback loop. These inflammatory molecules will also increase the permeability of the blood vessels and fluid will leak out of the bloodstream into the connective tissue of the damaged area leading to swelling. This will also cause redness within the area. But the increase in swelling puts pressure in the area, limiting the spread of damaging materials from lysosomes, from those dying cells, and limits the spread of viruses or bacteria that might be trying to migrate into the injured tissue. Other white blood cells are attracted to the inflammatory molecules, and these can come in and clear up the area of any debris or pathogens, which will set the stage for regeneration. Regeneration, however, will take significantly more time than the inflammatory response. So we get an injury, we get blood clot formation, which you should have learned about in a prerequisite. This triggers the inflammatory response. White blood cells can help clean up the area, but to really regenerate this damaged tissue is going to take more than increasing blood flow from the capillaries we already had. We're going to need more capillaries than that. So damage to this area, after we clean it all up, can trigger angiogenesis, and we'll get the growth of more blood vessels, bringing more blood into this area. That blood can be used to undergo mitosis and replace some of the damaged cells that were lost. This is part of the regenerative phase. And at this point, we might be producing a reddish looking scar. This is happening weeks after the initial injury. That scar is going to be composed mostly of scar tissue made by fibroblasts, which migrate into the area. We produce scar tissue first because fibroblasts can produce scar tissue quickly, filling in the wound, and this will prevent any bacteria or other nasty things from getting across our skin into the bloodstream. But we may not want that scar tissue there permanently. So after we've regenerated some tissue, we can use that scar tissue as a scaffold to replace it with dense, irregular connective tissue. That would be part of the remodeling phase. And once we've done that, we could remove the unnecessary blood vessels that we created in the first place. The cells that make up those blood vessels would undergo apoptosis and be removed in a neat, orderly fashion, without any risk of them dumping their lysosomes onto their neighbors, because one of the steps of apoptosis is to neutralize all of the acids in the lysosomes and mitochondria first. At this point, the reddish scar would be turning into more of a whitish scar or be completely replaced by the tissue that was there in the first place. And this, of course, takes months before it can be accomplished. That's a very different time frame from the inflammatory response, where you see redness occurring very quickly after an injury. Now that we've covered the histology of the skin, let's compare that to the histology of the oral mucosa. First off, the naming of the layers of the skin was fairly logical. The epidermis was the epithelial layer, a stratified squamous epithelium, and the dermis was composed of two types of connective tissue, areolar and dense irregular connective tissue. We find the same types of tissue in the oral cavity. That's because the skin and the oral cavity share the same family members. 
However, we've divided up their children a little bit differently. We say that the stratified squamous epithelium and the areolar connective tissue both belong to the oral mucosa, and that the dense irregular connective tissue would be considered part of the submucosa. So those more old-fashioned names, mucosa versus submucosal layers, to an embryologist are misnamed. And that's because we've split the two connective tissue family members into two separate families. And right now, we just need to acknowledge that we've split those two along some strange borders. And understanding that, we can now move along. The oral mucosa, like the skin, is composed of a stratified squamous epithelium, composed mostly of keratinocytes, and then we also include the thin layer of areolar connective tissue underneath it. Sometimes you will see that areolar connective tissue named the lamina propria, which is a bit of an old-fashioned name. And then underneath those two parts of the mucosa would be found the submucosa, which is dense irregular connective tissue, composed primarily of collagen fibers pointing in more or less random directions. And like in the skin, this submucosa provides the strength to the tissues found in the oral cavity. The epithelial cells in the mucosa produce keratin, therefore we call them keratinocytes, and this is a tough water-resistant protein. And as we'll see, we'll make more of this protein in regions of the oral mucosa that require more toughness. The outer layer of our skin was completely keratinized, but the layer of the oral mucosa is going to be either non-keratinized or sometimes partially keratinized. When it's non-keratinized, that means all the cells of that mucosal layer all the way to the surface are living and therefore we can find nucleuses all the way to the apical surface. Whereas in a keratinized epithelium, the outer layer of cells are dead and we don't find nucleuses there. The cells here look kind of flaky. Now, before I move on, I just want to point out there are not air pockets found within keratinized stratified squamous epithelia. The cells are dead and packed tightly together, and they only flake away because we're slicing through thin layers of them, and that breaks apart some of their structure. So in the oral mucosa, we typically find partially or non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Whereas in the skin, we find keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Nonetheless, both the skin and the oral mucosa have in common this outer layer of stratified squamous epithelial cells. And whether they're keratinized, partially keratinized, or non-keratinized depends on how much friction they receive. So what this means, and bear with me, I'm going to go all the way back to chapter one here, is that the epithelial cells of the oral mucosa, as they differentiate into keratinocytes, will leave the genes for producing keratin unmethylated and not packed around histones. Conversely, they will methylate the genes for producing collagen because these are epithelial cells, not fibroblasts. They're not going to produce collagen. So those genes would be methylated and packed around histones and not used. But back to the ones for keratin, we can use them in the keratinocytes found within the oral mucosa, but we might not. The transcription 
of these genes, that short-term regulation, is going to be dependent more on the environment of these cells, not their fate, not their lineage, but where they find themselves located. And what we're going to see is that the amount of keratin produced in the oral mucosa can change. Those changes could tell you something about systemic condition, such as the patient has diabetes or a vitamin deficiency. Or it may show you some things about localized conditions, such as the patient is experiencing bruxism at night or uses tobacco during the day. These things can lead to changes in keratin production either globally within the oral mucosa or in localized regions within the oral mucosa. Before we get to those clinical considerations, let's first talk about what the tissues in the oral mucosa should look like. And what we'll see is that they will fall into one of three categories. The epithelium of the oral mucosa may be a lining mucosa. This will be a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Or it may be a masticatory mucosa where we will find a partially keratinized epithelium. And then in a few places, we'll find some very special things, and we will call them specialized mucosa. But our first distinction is pretty easy. Non-keratinized versus partially keratinized. The lining mucosa are non-keratinized. Therefore, we're going to find living cells all the way up to the apical surface. And we will find these types of tissues in locations that don't undergo a lot of friction or other stresses, such as in the buccal, labial, alveolar, floor of the mouth, ventral surface of the tongue, and soft palate locations. This type of epithelium is good at stretching and compressing and has generally a softer surface than the masticatory mucosa. The epidermis and aligning mucosa can be said to have three layers, an outer, a middle, and an inner layer. Now, I've never actually seen any license exam questions on the names of these three layers. And I'm not going to make any promises as to what's going to be on that exam, since I don't write it. But if we're going to do a little triage here, I would suggest to you that maybe memorizing the correct names for the three layers of the epithelial tissue found within the lining mucosa may not be worth much of your time. What is important is that the stem cells, like any epithelium, are located down here in the basal layer. And as those cells differentiate and get older, they are pushed outwards. Where the epithelial cells of these lining mucosa meet the underlying areolar connective tissue will be fewer reti ridges and dermal papillae than you would find in the masticatory type of mucosa. And that's because regions of lining mucosa undergo a lot less stress and the masticatory mucosa. And therefore, the connection between epithelium and connective tissue doesn't need to be quite as strong. Furthermore, there will be a little bit more loose connective tissue found underneath in the submucosa. This provides for more elasticity and compressibility in these regions of the oral cavity which is important for speech and swallowing, at the cost of a little bit less strength due to fewer collagen fibers being present. The labial and buccal oral mucosa should appear opaquish pink and moist because of the low levels of keratin being produced here. There may be regions of melanin production from melanocytes, 
There may also be four dice spots or little yellowish spots. This is produced by sebaceous glands, which in the skin are associated with hair follicles. But here in the oral mucosa, where there are no hair follicles, these sebaceous glands don't really have a function. And rather than depositing their sebum onto a hair itself, it gets trapped underneath the keratinocytes of the oral mucosa. We will see later that the oral mucosa in these regions shares a lot in common with the epidermis of the skin, with the exception, of course, that there are no hair follicles inside here. There may be regions of keratinized tissue. One common area is the linea alba, or a white line found where the maxillary and mandibular teeth meet. This can cause a little bit of extra friction here on the buccal regions of the oral mucosa. And the keratinocytes there will respond to this by producing a little bit more keratin. Keratin doesn't have a color, but it can block some of the coloration of the blood found deeper within the dermis. Therefore, the pinkish regions of oral mucosa are pink because of hemoglobin found within the submucosal regions. And in regions of oral mucosa that appear more whitish, that blood is still there, but our view of that blood supply is blocked by the opaque but colorless protein keratin. The ventral surface of the tongue is significantly more red than the buccal and labial regions of mucosa because of the increased vascularity found within the submucosal region, as well as the fact that the mucosa is much thinner in this area. The significance of this is there are a few medications that can be given sublingually. The drugs are capable of being absorbed across the stratified squamous epithelium of the mucosa into the capillaries found within the submucosa. The soft palate is another lining mucosa. It should be a deep pink color. It is highly compressible and elastic, which once again is important for speech and swallowing. The histology of the soft palate is similar to other regions of the oral mucosa, except that the submucosa is extremely thin. And therefore, we can spot the underlying muscular tissues a little bit more easily with the naked eye. There are a few other regions of lining mucosa that we must cover. The first is the alveolar mucosa. This should be reddish pink in color, and it lines the oral vestibule. The epithelium here, like all of these other regions, is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium with a little bit of underlying areolar or connective tissue. There may or not may not be dermal papillae in this area. The larger the dermal papillae, the more bumpy the surface would appear. So to review, we've covered a number of regions of lining mucosa. These are all non-keratinized, with the exception of specific regions like that linea alba, which may become partially keratinized. And then the underlying submucosa, which generally has very small ret pegs and dermal papillae between the epithelium and connective tissue. Next up, let's cover the masticatory mucosa. These are one of two different types of partially keratinized epithelia, which can be called ortho or para keratinized epithelia. The difference between ortho and parakeratinized is pretty minimal. They both produce keratin, 
But whether we call them ortho or parakeratinized depends on whether you can see their nucleuses or not. And that's something that would only occur under the microscope, which is not something that occurs in a clinical situation. So what I would say to you is that we can more or less consider these two synonymous. They are both examples of a partially keratinized epithelium. And whether we say it's ortho or para is a pretty minute detail based off of whether you can see nucleuses under the microscope, not something that we're going to be terribly concerned about in clinical situations. What is more important to you is that the mucosa here is going to have much more pronounced reti ridges connecting it to the underlying connective tissue. That will mean there's a much stronger connection between epithelium and connective tissue, which is important because this type of mucosa is found in regions of the oral cavity where there's a lot of stress caused, for instance, by friction from chewing. The increased levels of keratin production relative to the lining mucosa means that masticatory mucosa should appear more whitish in color. For instance, the parakeratinized epithelium of the attached gingiva appear more whitish than the regions of the lining mucosa next door. Furthermore, this type of oral mucosa should appear stippled or bumpy to the naked eye. And that is caused by those larger reti pegs and dermal papillae, those big bumps where the epithelium meets the connective tissue lead to a bumpy surface of the epithelium. Very similar to the attached gingiva, are the interdental and marginal gingiva. Here's the interdental, and here is the marginal gingiva. These are also examples of masticatory mucosa, and therefore appear more whitish than the alveolar mucosa. Another example of a masticatory mucosa is the hard palate. And once again, it appears more whitish because of the increased amount of keratin produced here. To review, the lining mucosa should appear more pinkish and smoother and moister because they produce less or no keratin and because they don't have pronounced reti pegs and dermal papillae between the epithelial and connective tissue layers. They may, however, have a higher amount of elastic fibers found within the connective tissue layers, which allows for more stretching and compressibility, which is important because these regions tend to be involved in swallowing and speech. The masticatory mucosa, on the other hand, are more keratinized and have more pronounced reti pegs and dermal papillae because these regions of the oral cavity undergo more stress, especially from chewing. Another interesting region of oral mucosa is found at the dentogingival junction, and this will include a sulcular and junctional epithelium. This is a particularly important region of the oral cavity, enough so that we don't just lump this into masticatory or lining mucosa. We talk about these specifically. So I have highlighted here in my cartoon, the sulcular or cravicular epithelium, which is a non-keratinized or parakeratinized epithelium. We shouldn't have terribly high amounts of keratin produced here because there should not be a lot of friction here. Food should not be getting down in here and being involved in the chewing process. The 
saliva found in this region is a little bit different from the rest of the saliva. And in fact, we don't call it saliva. We call it gingival crevicular fluid produced here by the epithelium. The depth or the length of this sulcular epithelium should be measured in millimeters from one half to about three millimeters. We say that the lamina propria found in the sulcular epithelium is smooth. What that means is that we do not find really large or pronounced reti pegs and dermal papillae between the connection of the epithelium and connective tissue. And that's because this region of the oral cavity is not undergoing a lot of stress from chewing. Therefore, we don't need a super strong connection between the epithelium and connective tissue. Down below that is a very special region called the junctional epithelium. And what makes this particularly unique is what's happening on either side of this epithelium. Up until now, the basal side of an epithelium was always facing some sort of connective tissue. And the apical side was always facing outside of the human body. But here in the junctional epithelium, the basal cells are touching connective tissue, whereas the apical cells are connected to the tooth. So we've got human body on both sides of this epithelium, whereas everywhere else, the epithelium was lining the body. This is going to be because of the unique embryological or lineage of these particular epithelial cells. The epithelium found here within the sulcular and junctional epithelium is particularly thin, which means that white blood cells found here in the connective tissue are going to have an easier time migrating across the epithelium to get to other parts of the human body, such as here in the gingivocrevicular fluid and possibly come into contact with oral bacteria. Just a quick refresher back from chapter one. Desmosomes were anchoring junctions between two cells, such as two epithelial cells. But in the junctional epithelium, we find that the apical cells have hemidesmosomes and integrins, another important plasma membrane protein helping these epithelial cells to anchor to proteins and possibly some carbohydrates found in the extracellular matrix of the enamel. It's important that these epithelial cells connect to the correct type of extracellular matrix. So to review, we've now covered the masticatory mucosa. These types of tissues undergo more stress and therefore tend to be partially keratinized and have much more pronounced reti pegs and dermal papillae between the epithelium and connective tissue layers. With the exception of the dentogingival junction, these tissues here are pretty special and whether we lump them in with masticatory or lining or consider them their own separate type of mucosa is a little bit less important than what's actually happening in this part of the body. But before we go on to the specialized mucosa, let's instead cover some of the clinical applications to the knowledge that we've just covered in the lining and masticatory mucosa. First off, the amount of keratin that is produced is highly dependent on the amount of stress that these regions of the oral cavity undergo. That's why we find more keratin produced in the masticatory regions rather than in the lining regions. But even the lining regions, if they undergo more stress, can produce more keratin. And if they're producing more keratin than normal, we would call that hyper 
keratosis. This can be a response to any number of a different type of stresses. Those stresses could be localized, such as from grinding of the teeth during sleep or bruxism, or the use of tobacco products. Or those stresses could be more systemic, such as a vitamin A deficiency. You may not think of that as a classical form of stress, like the stress from a dental hygiene exam, but this does put stress on cells. The regions of the oral cavity that respond to these stresses by producing more keratin and therefore appearing more whitish, we would call leukoplakia. Leuco is our prefix for white, like leukocyte. One particular form of leukoplakia is nicotinic stomatitis, where we see regions of the hard palate undergoing hyperkeratinization. This can also be due to the consumption of hot liquids. And what we see here is an increased amount of keratin, therefore the hard palate appears even more whitish than it normally does. However, the hard palate contains a number of minor salivary glands, and the epithelial cells of these salivary glands are not capable of producing keratin. So these regions of the oral cavity remain pinkish and appear as little pinkish islands found within this increasingly whitish background. Next up, there are very important changes to the gingiva that are associated with periodontal disease. Edema is the increase of fluids that can be seen in a tissue causing swelling. This is especially noticeable in the interdental regions of the oral cavity. This is caused by an inflammatory response that occurs after damage to a tissue happens and the increase in the size of the interdental gingiva is due to increased amounts of fluid found especially within the connective tissue regions of the oral mucosa, causing it to swell and appear larger. Gingival hyperplasia appears very similar, but is caused by something very different. Once again, our attached gingiva, especially the interdental regions, may appear larger than normal. But in this case, the increase in size is not due to an increase in the amount of fluid here. It's instead caused by an increase in the amount of tissue here, especially an increased number of cells. For instance, there are a number of drugs that can trigger the stem cells of the epithelium to undergo mitosis a little bit more than they should, and therefore will have more cells than necessary found in these regions of the gingiva. So the take home lesson here is that gingival hyperplasia is caused by an excess growth of cells, not by an increase in the amount of fluid. This does not represent an inflammatory response, such as could be caused by infections or disease, but instead may be caused by chemicals that mimic growth factors that trigger cell division. The gingiva previously I've said is pinkish or whitish, but I've been ignoring the fact that melanin may be present here. This melanin is the same type of melanin that's produced in other regions of the skin and may be inherited from family members. What's different about the melanin here is that it's not being in, produced in response to sunlight, the way that people's skin would get darker or lighter when they're exposed to more or less sun and instead represents more of a background production of melanin, 
again, that background of something that you may have inherited from your parents, even though it's not caused by genes that you inherited from your parents. Melanin has a number of important functions. One is to absorb UV light, but that's not something that your gingiva typically have to worry about. Another important function of melanin is that it can resist friction, which is why melanin production occurs in regions of the body that may experience friction, such as in the nipples of women during pregnancy or after pregnancy, or in regions of the rectum and anus. The sun doesn't shine there, therefore you don't need melanin to absorb UV light there. Instead, the melanin in these parts of the body is doing something else. Its job here is to reduce the friction, which in the gingiva, once again, would help protect it from the friction caused by chewing. When there's too much friction occurring on the gingiva, the cells may begin to die and mitosis can't keep up with that cell death, leading to gingival recession. This can be caused by all sorts of different problems, including periodontal disease, uh, abrasion and abfraction, and even just occurs as we get older. If gingival recession adopts a V-like shape, we would call that a Stillman cleft. And this is usually caused by occlusal trauma. If gingival recession is severe enough, some form of surgery may be required. One common type of surgery is called a subepithelial graft. Before I talk about this, Really quickly, just look at that phrase, subepithelial. And what do you find underneath the epithelium in the oral mucosa? Well, that's connective tissue. Either the areolar connective tissue of the lamina propria or the dense irregular connective tissue of the submucosa. So when we have severe regions of gingival recession, we may not be able to just wait for the body to grow new tissue from the edges and instead we want to provide the human body with a scaffolding so it can grow from all of the damaged region all at once and that's when we would do a sub epithelial graft you would cut away healthy tissue from some other part of the gums and then take the connective tissue portion of that and sew it over these damaged regions. One problem with that is you've now just caused some damage elsewhere where there wasn't damage before. And so another option is to graft on something other than the patient's own cells. For instance, a pericardial patch might be used. This takes the pericardium from a cow which is mostly connective tissue or collagen fibers. And you graft this into the damaged area. And those collagen fibers provide a scaffold over which epithelial stem cells can migrate, undergo mitosis, and then differentiate into new keratinocytes. And the bonus from either one of these procedures is that you get regeneration of the tissue, not just from the edges, which would be really slow, but across the whole area all at once. And you're not grafting the epithelial cells. You're instead grafting extracellular matrix, which provides a scaffolding over which stem cells can migrate and differentiate into the cells that are actually needed. Another clinical consideration that we should cover is what happens when a tooth is lost and needs to be replaced with some form of dental implant. First off, to attach a dental implant, we'll need to make some sort of incision in the oral mucosa. But if there's a little bit of bone loss underneath, we may not have enough tissue there to anchor a dental implant properly. 
Therefore, after we've exposed this tissue by removing the mucosa, we may do some form of scaffold graft into the bone tissue, replacing the missing area with bone tissue from somewhere else in the human body, or even from other types of things that resemble bone tissue. And once we've filled in the area with enough material that could anchor a screw tightly, and it's all healed up properly, then we can drill into it to provide the base for a dental implant. The question, though, is how is the epithelium that normally attaches to a tooth going to attach to this dental implant once it's screwed in? But unlike the connection that occurs in healthy teeth, where junctional epithelium adheres to the enamel by hemidesmosomes, Around a dental implant, oral mucosa just butts up next to it. This connection is not nearly as tight and therefore may allow bacteria to enter into the underlying bloodstream more easily. To prevent this, a free gingival graft may be done where keratinized tissue may be grafted into this area with the hope that it will adhere a little bit more tightly to the surface of the tooth. Or a xenograft may be done, meaning tissue from another type of animal may be sewn into place to try and promote the growth of healthy junctional epithelium from the patient's own cells to the dental implant. And if you wish, if you go to the PDF, you can click on these links and do a little bit of further reading. But I'm going to move on to probing depth. Earlier, I said that the junctional and sulcular epithelium should be about one half to three millimeters in length, or as we usually say, depth. And this can be measured by a special type of probe, sliding it between the tooth and the sulcular epithelium until it reaches the junctional epithelium and its attachment to the tooth. This epithelium here tends to be thinner than the other regions of epithelium in the oral mucosa. And this means that white blood cells have an easier time migrating out of the submucosa to regions outside the body. And it also means that microorganisms might be able to get across this mucosa more easily into the body. Nevertheless, when microorganisms come into contact with white blood cells, this typically triggers an inflammatory response, which, as you remember, can lead to swelling or edema. Therefore, we often see regions of swelling in this part of the body. Any damage to the junctional or sulcular epithelium is going to lead to edema here. This may indicate underlying periodontal disease or gingivitis. Because this epithelium is very thin, if it becomes damaged, then blood from the underlying submucosa can leak out of the body more easily, which we would call bleeding on probing. Bleeding on probing is going to occur more frequently when there is underlying gingivitis or periodontitis. Gingivitis is inflammation of the gingival tissues, whereas periodontitis is inflammation to even deeper tissues and is typically more severe. In this cartoon of a periodontal pocket, what we are seeing here is that under healthy conditions, the junctional epithelium should adhere to the tooth surface tightly, but with periodontitis or gingivitis, we see that the epithelial attachment is more distal to the tooth surface, which leads to a deeper pocket. And when this happens, the very thin epithelium can easily be damaged, leading to bleeding on probing. And that's because whether we have a healthy attachment or not, there are blood vessels 
found within the lamina propria and then in this very region of the oral cavity where the epithelium is thinnest this is the easiest place for the epithelium to become damaged allowing blood to leak out of the lamina propria across the epithelium and be visible from the surface of the body next up is a furcation which can occur when there is significant recession of the gingiva exposing the roots of the teeth this can be identified with a special type of probe called a neighbor's probe and this is a problem because when the roots are not embedded firmly within underlying bone tissue the teeth can become more mobile and even lost this can occur with untreated periodontitis one of the responses of the human body to inflammation is to halt the cell cycle we're going to go through the inflammatory response and clean up the damage before we regenerate but if inflammation is chronic we never get to the regeneration and so by slowing down mitosis as we wait for the white blood cells to clean up debris and infection if that never gets cleaned up we never get back to the mitosis and so we lose the tissue with chronic inflammation which here we would call periodontitis and if that loss of tissue is significant enough it can expose very large regions of the tooth to counteract this we may try and give the cells a scaffolding over which to grow and to induce them to undergo mitosis so one of the scaffolds that we use is the carbohydrate found in ground substance hyaluronic acid this is a large glycosaminoglycan which can attract water forming a gel and through this gel stem cells can migrate and then be instructed to undergo mitosis so hyaluronic acid can be used in all sorts of different types of dental interventions it can be used to fill in gaps it can be used around furcations and it can even be used as a coating for dental implants which helps epithelial cells to stick to the dental implant making for a seal that mimics the junctional epithelium more than what would otherwise happen oral mucosa just growing up until they bump into the dental implant again if you go to the pdf you can click on this link to read more about the use of hyaluronic acid in different types of dental surgeries but here's some more images of the use of hyaluronic acid in some of these surgeries to tr try and promote the growth of the patient's own cells to regenerate the healthy tissue that's necessary next is an abscess this can occur if periodontal pockets become infected and if that infection is occurring deep within the pocket the swelling and inflammation that we may see may be occurring deep in the pocket but the bulge that we see is here at the surface of the healthy attached gingiva that are on the other side of the periodontal pocket so those are a number of clinical considerations that each should illustrate one of the basic possibly even kind of boring facts of the oral mucosa but before i move on let's just summarize once again the turnover time of these different regions of the oral cavity and as you should see here the oral cavity undergoes a lot more mitosis and replacement and does the skin of course the skin tends to be a little bit thicker than the oral mucosa but the oral mucosa of junctional epithelium the cells here are being completely replaced every five days that's significantly faster 
than the replacement of cells in the skin. Lastly, if you wish to estimate the mobility of a tooth due to tissue loss, you must estimate the entire loss of connection between the tooth and other tissues. And that will involve both the gingival recession amount plus the pocket depth. Those two numbers added together would indicate the relative amount of mobility that a tooth would have due to recession. And that will bring us to the last portion of the lecture, the histology of the tongue, which includes some specialized mucosa. The submucosa, let's start there, why not? At the anterior portion of the tongue includes a bunch of striated muscle in various bundles and some adipose tissue. The posterior portion of the tongue includes more adipose tissue and salivary glands. In an upcoming lecture, we'll, we'll see that there's a pretty distinct border between what you find anteriorly and posteriorly because of the different lineages of the cells found in these areas. But now let's focus on the mucosa of the tongue, specifically on the ventral surface, which includes a masticatory mucosa, which is a partially keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, and regions of specialized mucosa. These are the lingual papillae. The filiform papillae are partially keratinized epithelial cells that form tooth-like or scale-like structures that provide friction on the surface of the tongue. There are no taste buds in these regions. The fungiform papillae are mushroom-shaped structures on the surface of the tongue, and these contain as well a partially keratinized epithelium as well as taste buds and a significant amount of vascularization underneath the mucosa. The foliate papillae are on the sides of the tongue. These are also partially keratinized and also contain taste buds. The last type of bump or papillae on the tongue are the circumvolate papillae, which are very large structures just anterior to the sulcus terminalis. By very large, I mean, of course, they're large enough to see with a naked eye. These are also partially keratinized and contain a significant number of taste buds. They also contain a significant number of minor salivary glands, which get the special name von Ebner's glands, if you wish to remember the person who discovered them. Now, before I move on, does it seem important whether these are ortho or parakeratinized? I would say no, they're partially keratinized. And whether there are nucleuses or not, doesn't seem relevant to any sort of pathology that we're going to see in the oral cavity. One pathology that you might see is geographic tongue. This is specific to the filiform papillae, where they switch from para to orthokeratinized, making more keratin. And therefore, there are specific regions of the tongue that appear more whitish rather than reddish. These regions can change with time, and as far as anybody knows at this point, there is no reason to worry about this other than it changes the appearance of the tongue. Black hairy tongue is another condition that affects the filiform papillae, and in this case the cells do not die as, and be shed as quickly as they should be and instead remained attached to these filiform papillae. Because the cells remain on the surface of the tongue for longer, they are able to take up more staining chemicals, 
and this changes the color of the tongue, especially if the patient engages in behaviors where they ingest more staining chemicals, such as tobacco use. The other types of papillae, the fungiform foliate and circumvolate, are the ones that contain taste buds. These are highly specialized epithelial cells that have receptors that can bind chemicals found within food and help to convert the binding of those chemicals at the plasma membrane to surface proteins into electrical signals that are then carried to the brain by neurons that are attached to these epithelial cells. In biology, we would say that these cells act as a transducer. They are changing one signal, a chemical signal in food, into another type of signal, an electrical signal, similar to the way that a microphone can change sound wave signals into electrical signals. There are two types of cells found within a taste bud, the ones that do the actual transduction, the taste cells, and then there are also supporting cells. Although it would be very difficult to identify which is which under a traditional H&E stain, such as the one shown here in this picture. The last thing I want to cover is that although there are six different types of taste buds for tasting sweet, salty, sour, bitter, water and umami found within the ventral surface and lateral surfaces of the tongue. These are not distributed in any sort of map. They can be aggregated in specific locations. Yes, but that is not consistent from person to person. So while one little region of one person's tongue may be more sensitive to salt over sour, on another person's tongue, it may be sour over salt. That's going to lead us to the last part of the lecture, where I can cover some review questions that should help you to focus on the material that we've covered over the last hour. So let's go through this case study where we have a 50 year old woman where she has bilateral linea alba. You should know what that is by now and nicotine stomatitis. Well, we haven't covered that quite yet, although it's going to be very similar to something that we've discussed in lab. Her gingiva are light and coral pink and fibrous. She's got bleeding on probing and a bunch of calculus and bacterial plaque. So we have a bunch of information here. Let's focus in on the actual questions. Don't get too lost on the actual case study information until it comes into question. The first question is pretty well focused. The blood on probing comes from which of the following? Now, don't get distracted. It would be really easy to get confused between trying to decide whether it's sulcular or junctional epithelium across which the blood flows. But we're asking where the blood is coming from, and I've already asked you this question in a previous lecture. And as we know from that previous lecture, epithelial tissues are avascular. The blood is not coming from either of these epithelial tissues. So you don't have to worry whether it's the actual sulcular or junctional epithelium that's been damaged. And instead, that's going to leave us with just the connective tissue. Next, we're going to talk about the pale pink color to her gingiva. What is causing that? Could it be decreased vascularity, increased keratinization, the thickness of the epithelium, or the amount of melanin? Well, her smoking habit is a stress. And as I mentioned in this lecture, increased amounts of stress will definitely lead to increased amounts of keratinization. 
That's probably the answer I would have chosen initially, and I would have been wrong because all of these can technically contribute to the color of the tissue. So increased levels of stress can also trigger increased amounts of mitosis, which can lead to a increased in the thickness of the tissue. That will also lead to the lighter appearance of this tissue, blocking the reddish appearance of the blood underneath. I find this part particularly tricky, melanin. But melanin technically is one of our skin pigments, so it does contribute to skin color. Even in this case, it's really only contributing by not really being here in this particular gingival tissue. And lastly, the decreased vascularity is not something that I covered in this particular lecture. I did cover increased vascularization following damage, but I did not cover this one. So this is a little bit tricky here. And honestly, I think adding this one uh, is really only going to be obvious if you're also including, say, option D and option C, which were slightly easier to understand. And therefore, the correct answer to this question, which I still find to be pretty tricky, is all of the above. Honestly, had I written this question, I would have said something like, what is the most relevant or what best describes the change in color rather than which options could possibly contribute to the change in color. I included this here just as a little bit of an example of using psychology to sometimes answer questions that are tricky or confusing. You have to pay a little bit more attention to some of the language in the question rather than your dental hygiene knowledge. And, and I believe it's this last sentence here, to which can the color be attributed? And that's fairly open-ended. So I'm sorry for this question. I did not write it, but I've included it here just as a little bit of warning that sometimes Things are going to be confusing on these tests. The next one, I think, is a little bit more straightforward. The circular lining would most likely have the following composition. Is it going to be keratinized or non-keratinized? That's the first thing that we can decide. And will it have reti pegs or not? So. It's sulcular. And in this lecture, we said uh, the sulcular epithelium typically did not have reti pegs. So let's go ahead and scratch those out. And then we just have to decide is it keratinized or non keratinized? And here it gets a little tricky because I believe on that slide I said it would be non keratinized or partially keratinized. But given that option, I believe non-keratinized here is going to be our best option. Lastly, how about her buccal mucosa? Well, going back to the reading here, it says she has bilateral linea alba, or white lines along her cheeks. And if you can see white lines along her cheeks, the whitish is caused by increased keratinization. And you would only notice that if the borders have little or no keratinized tissue. So it's not completely keratinized and not completely non-keratinized. <laughs> so I would suggest the best answer is mostly non-keratinized with that region of increased keratinization. 
lastly, the elongated papillae on her tongue are most likely caused by which of the following? And if you go back to the lecture, it was just a few slides ago. We said that the hairy tongue were caused by a lack of cell death, or, or I should say an increase in the longevity of the cells of the filiform papillae that then would take up the stains found within the tobacco to become more noticeable. So I've got a few more questions that I pulled from a different source. Melanocytes are found in which area of the stratified squamous epithelium? Ooh, I didn't cover this in this lecture, but if you went back to your prerequisites, you might remember that those cells are found in the deepest layer or the basal layer of the epithelium. Next, what attachment mechanism is found between the cells of the stratum spinosum that causes them to appear to be star shaped? Now, this is a question about the skin. And again, you might jump down the rabbit hole and start thinking about what is this stratum spinosum. But in reality, you can ignore the stratum spinosum. We just need what attachment is found between cells in an epithelium. It's not hemidesmosomes. It is the desmosomes that are the biggest and strongest ones that might contribute to their shape. There are probably tight junctions between these cells as well, but these are pretty small and would not have a significant impact on the overall shape of those cells. And there might uh, possibly be some gap junctions, but once again, these would not be a significant, uh, these would not be uh, very important when it comes to the overall shape of an epithelium. Okay, let's see if I can get through this. Which area of the mouth consists of the thinnest and most permeable stratified squamous epithelium. Well, given all of these options, you know, we didn't exactly count the number of cells. But if you recall, I said that some drugs could be taken sublingually because that's the region of the oral cavity where chemicals could get across the epithelium the most easily. So that should lead you to this answer here the floor of the mouth. Lastly, uh, normally keratinized gingiva may undergo reduced keratinization because of which of the following stimuli? Ooh, and this is not something I covered in the lecture. I did cover that friction could increase keratinization. So now if we're asking what could decrease keratinization, it definitely should not be friction or any other type of stress like smoking or vigorous brushing. And that's just going to lead us to inflammation. But here's a general pattern that I think you can take home. Is that any time a tissue is undergoing damage and you get an inflammatory response, typically the cells suspend their operations to try and fix that damage. Now, if they're allowed to fix that damage, they often fix it by becoming tougher. And in the case of an epithelium, that might lead to more keratinization. But if we get prolonged inflammation, where we never get a chance to fix the damage, then that's where you would see cells producing less keratin because they're too busy responding to the inflammatory response to undergo the processes that they normally would in their day-to-day -day job of producing keratin. So this is a question where you might answer more based off of elimination. But again, that's a pattern that you should expect to see anywhere in the human body, including the oral cavity with chronic inflammation. Whatever cell type it is that you're talking about, it's probably not going to be doing its job very well, whatever job that is. And if its job is to 
produce some sort of structure, then whatever structure that is, whether it's the keratinized epithelium, or whether it's the density of bone tissue, or the density of connective tissues between the two, you might see a reduction in that. But those were the questions that I was able to find that were relevant to this chapter. Oh wait, two more relevant to the tongue. Geographic tongue is a condition that involves which of the following types of papillae? And that's just a straightforward question that you need to know the answer. There's no logic to it. It's the filiform papillae. Those are the ones that are the most numerous on the surface of the tongue. So if you're going to see something on the tongue, it's probably them. And lastly, what's the treatment for geographic tongue? Well, I said it didn't really cause any problems other than the appearance of the tongue. And in fact, the treatment is there is no treatment. We typically don't try and use drugs to treat things that don't cause health concerns because drugs come with side effects that may cause health concerns. And with that, I think we're done.